and have them maybe spend a minute or two telling a little bit about who they are, what their role is, and, and maybe a war story or two as, as we get through those. And on my immediate left is Mr. Jim Buckaloo. He's Executive Vice President, Technical Operations and Technology at Western Global Airlines. Jim? Thank you. And I hope uh, you can hear me. Great. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, again, Jim Buckaloo here. I'm a two-time alum with uh, Embry-Riddle. And um, Really glad to be here again as uh, Senior Vice President of Technical Operations with Western Global. Um, we fly worldwide, uh, all cargo airlines, and uh, my career spans both technical operations leadership and technology. Thank you, Thank you Jim. Uh, next, we have Mr. Rick Hale, Chairman and CEO of Winter Aviation Corporation. Rick? Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, located in Northeastern Ohio, uh, Winter Aviation is an aviation service group, and uh, I own it. Um, we do heavy aircraft maintenance and uh, repair, avionics installs and repair, turbine engine repairs. Um, that side of business is all maintenance. And then the other side is ground handling. Uh, we ground handle in five different cities for Allegiant currently. And uh, we're trying to expand both uh, operations. I'm an alumni, uh, 1984 from Daytona, and uh, I've been able to work in not only the general aviation sector of the industry, but also uh, the leasing end of it. And um, I've been on the board, uh, on the committee or board now since 1997. So, um, and then I enjoy. Uh, I enjoy collaborating with uh, the, uh, the professors and the students, and uh, we're glad to see you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Next, we have Mr. Roger Smeltzer, formerly of Textron Aviation and now president of Smeltzer Aviation Solutions. Roger? Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I've been on the uh, Business Leadership Council now for five years. And I'm also an executive in residence. This is my first year. And I've been in uh, a business in general aviation for 52 years. Started out at uh, actually Winter Aviation, which was one time Beckett Aviation in Youngstown, Ohio, waxing airplanes at 16 years old. Roger's so, being kind. He was my boss at one time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've been involved with um, many different aspects of the business, NetJets in Columbus, Ohio. Beechcraft, and uh, also FBO management, OEM, MRO, and uh, new product development with the uh, Raytheon Premier One and Hawker Horizon, uh, all composite fuselage business jets, and also with Gulfstream Aerospace and jet engine overhauls. So I retired from Textron Aviation, Beechcraft, Cessna in 2019 and started my consulting company. So it's just a pleasure to be here, and I love mentoring students. Thank you, Roger. Um, next, we have Mr. Steve Becker, Sales Executive, MRO Services at Delta Tech Ops. Thank you, Mike. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to, Chris is in the back, waving at us. Welcome to the best choice you made of where to be at 3 p.m. on a Monday. Good choice. Amazing panel here, so please don't be shy after we're finished to ask questions because these opportunities don't grow on trees for you. So please don't be shy in asking questions after we're, after we're done. Steve Becker, I've been on the, uh, um, on, on, the, on, the on the board here for, um, this is my 15th year, um, and I enjoy giving back to the school that gave back to me. Graduated in 1986 with my master's degree in aviation management, and then since that time, I've had various and sundry jobs in the aviation industry that transcended airline operations. And I migrated into sales where I have been in technical sales for over 30 years. Started with the Pemco World Air Services. It was then in Alabama. It's now in Tampa where I sold aircraft maintenance modification. And then I worked for Pratt & Whitney Aircraft Engines for 20 years where I sold engine maintenance services. And I also sold uh, new engines for a period of time including the Pratt 2000, the 4000, and the geared turbofan. And after Pratt, it was time for a change, and I went to Delta. I've been at Delta six and a half years. 
and I'm responsible for a uh, sales team at Delta Tech Ops in Atlanta that's responsible for bringing in third party work to Delta. Most people think that, that all the buildings in Atlanta only house Delta engines and Delta parts and Delta landing gear and Delta aircraft. Well, it's not entirely true. Uh, over half of the work that comes to that facility, that massive, amazing facility in Atlanta are for airlines and operators other than Delta. And so I've been integrally involved in the MRO maintenance repair and overhaul world um, from a sales capacity, uh, as I said, for 30 years, and I've enjoyed it. And uh, these are, as, as people say, interesting times. So that's it. Thank you, Steve. Last but not least, Ms. Sloan Churchill, Senior Analyst, Asset Valuations at MBA Aviation, and a recent graduate of the O'Malley College of Business. Sloan? Hi, thank you. I have also had 30 years of experience in the MRO industry. Um, I graduated from Riddle with my master's in aviation finance in spring of 2019. Um, I started with Skyworks Capital, helping them do due diligence uh, to put together their ABS portfolio. And then I moved over to MBA Aviation, which is a consulting firm that specializes in uh, asset valuations. I work on the asset valuation team. I specialize in commercial fixed wing aircraft and commercial engines. Um, we also do maintenance forecasting and modeling, asset management, and IOSA uh, safety audits. Um, yeah, that's, that's me. Okay, thank you, Sloan. Well, as you can see, we've really got basically a think tank up here of MRO folks, so you're going to hear some great stuff today. Uh, we're going to spend the next hour or so talking about various topics. We've got some prepared questions for the panelists. And uh, at the end, we will make sure there is adequate time for some, some Q&A. So we'll get on to the first question. By the way, these questions are fairly long. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll read them and then we'll give the, the panelists, whoever would like to start, welcome to talk about these. Um, question number one, the impact of geopolitical events on the MRO industry can be both surprising and far reaching. How have recent events such as the conflict in Eastern Europe, i.e. Ukraine, affected the aviation industry and more specifically the MRO segment. And this includes things such as rare earth metals, leased aircraft and et cetera. Who would like to start or do we pick on somebody? I'll take a stab. Okay. So um, it's a good question. It's one we could probably talk about for the next three weeks, let alone the next hour um, because there is no precedent. It's never happened before. Um, people talk about 9-11, people talk about COVID. They were all dramatic and unique at the time. And what we're dealing with now um, is likewise unique and the industry's having to deal with it. There, there are so many components of this. I'm actually just gonna pick one piece of it because I, there's no way I could do justice to the entire impact to the MRO world. So I'm just going to pull one thread that, that, that Mike mentioned and that's rare earth metals. So for those of you who are not aware, Russia produces over 50% of the world's titanium. And let that, th let that sink in for just a second. Over 50% of the world's titanium is produced from Russia. When the sanctions went into place, that's obviously on one end of the equation. The other end of the equation is, well, they're gonna sure as heck stop selling it. So, in the aviation industry, titanium is used in aircraft, it's used in engines, it's used in components, it's used in switches, it's used in electronics. So there is probably, and both Boeing and Rolls-Royce put out a press release over several weeks ago, listing the amount of titanium they had left on the shelf. It wasn't very long. It's probably, it's less than a year. Now there are other producers of titanium in the world, but Russia by far is the largest producer. So we are in a situation that the industry is literally as we speak digesting. What does that mean? It's not just titanium, it's copper, it's nickel. It's other rare earth metals that are mined primarily in Siberia and have been for quite a long time. So there's gonna to have to be an adjustment. Um, the impact of this is, is almost endless to talk about. Prices going up, increased pressure to produce those 
um, those metals from other countries that do produce them now at an increased level at a higher price. Um, the reality is when Russia produces titanium, they do so. It's very bad for the environment, the process you have to go through to go from soil that's enriched with titanium to get a titanium ingot. If you know anything about that, it's, it's horrendous to the environment. It's tremendous to the people that do it. And the, the criteria uh, for, for the, the regulations that the Russians use are far less than other parts of the world. And the, but the reality is that the titanium that's produced by Russia is very high quality. So now we have a problem. And so what are we going to do with that? I don't know. But it's something that you start to digest it and think about it. Um, it's going to impact the industry, engines, components, aircraft. And that's just um, that's one piece of it. There's other parts to that question. So I just wanted to touch that one. Right, thank you, Steve. Who else would like to take a shot? Rick? I think you could also add to that uh, some of the uh, uh, geopolitical pressure with China and uh, the lithium, uh, the control they have over lithium and how important lithium is to um, electronics and uh, specifically avionics and other uh, equipment that the aircraft need as well as any other transportation. So. Uh, you know, you're you're getting a double whammy there, and I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's going to be pleasant. Okay, so Sloan, could you address the leased aircraft? Maybe? Oh, I was going to say, particularly um, new delivery aircraft will be affected um, primarily. Granted, the 787 isn't currently delivering for Boeing, but um, on the 777 platform, um, landing gear parts are forged uh, primarily by companies in Russia as well. So a lot of concerns uh, from the new aircraft delivery side as well. Yep. Mike, I'll try, to, um, I'll try to put the silver lining on this. Um, it creates innovation, right? Uh, clearly there's gonna be a shortage. Clearly the costs are gonna go up, uh, but that drives innovation. It drives innovation for engineers. It drives innovation for Embry Riddle, and uh, you know, space transport and hypersonic transport is going to be affected by these these uh, rare metals. But we also have to find an alternative. So whether it's here at Embry Riddle or elsewhere, you know, the shortage is going to certainly drive innovation where we had a supply, and uh, now we're going to look for other solutions. Mike, I'd also like to add that there's going to be a trickle-down effect in business aviation on manufacturing as well. Uh, not so much on the you know the big airplanes, yes, but the smaller airplanes, there's going to be a trickle-down effect. And I think, like uh, uh, he said, there'll be more people looking at composites and uh, alternate uh, ways we can build airplanes. Anybody else on, on the first question? We good? Okay. Number two, the MRO, MRO industry has experienced a number of trends that are or, or could have a significant impact on the market. Some of these issues include secondary aircraft and, and the secondary aircraft and engine market, such as corporate or commercial, uh, the recent surge in freighter conversions, the COVID-19 pandemic, which we'll hear a lot of, and, and there's, there's many others. So which of these or other trends not mentioned have you experienced and how have you seen values or other measurables such as production rates and such affected? Um, from the engine value side, we've seen a lot. Of, there's a tremendous backup um, in the MRO space for engine performance restorations right now, um, which has changed tremendously over COVID from um, kind of having a backup to airlines not putting engines through performance restoration, looking for green time in the market. And now we're getting to a point where there is no more green time in the market um, and engines need to go through overhaul, which is causing a larger um, bottleneck in that space, which then drives engine values, spare engine values. Um, so particularly on the narrow body side, um, V2500 values are increasing as are 7B values. Um, and on the wide body space, there's a lot of supply chain issues going on um, that have kind of 
caused additional additional issues besides uh, backups uh, at the MROs that have also affected values as well. So there's been a lot of values volatility, very much driven by uh, backups and supply chain issues with the MRO space. Yeah, and I have to back up on that. And in full disclosure, in our day jobs, actually Sloan and I talk several times a year uh, when MBA is putting their values together. She'll call me and we set up sessions where we talk about trends in the industry based upon engine types. So um, Sloan, and I, Sloan, <laughs> Sloan and I talk about this quite a bit. Um, does everybody understand the term green time? And what, what that is basically if you have a spare engine and that spare engine, if it's LLP limiter uh, isn't zero, if it's greater than zero before the engine has to come off wing, that's your green time. And that's, not, that's notated by cycles. And so what she was referring to is green time is engine, spare engines available to use to lease so you could avoid a shop visit. Well, as the old saying goes, you can only rob Peter to pay Paul for so long. You can't do that forever. And so it happened during COVID and then we sort of are on way out of COVID. And so it's different on each specific engine type. But what Sloan said about the backup for certain engine types, it's absolutely true. And the problem is the OEMs are having a difficult time with supply chain. And there's a double component to this. There's the outside repair vendors, what we call OSRs, um, that are struggling as well. So you have supply chain from the OEMs directly, and then you have issues with the OSR vendors with their turnaround times going up. So what's happening is, is engines are in the shop longer than they otherwise would have been with at increased prices. Um, so that pricing pressure um, and performance pressure um, for airlines uh, that are having to have engines overhauled, uh, that pressure is very real. And it's not going away anytime soon. It is getting better, albeit slowly, but it's there. Anything else for this question? Well, that could just lead to uh, aircraft actually being grounded and cannibalized to keep the rest of the fleet, some of these fleets flying. That becomes a problem. So to, to avert from that, you know, we need to get this supply chain back in the shape if possible. Um, that's who I think some of the reason why we see some of the airlines having to uh, cancel some flights is because of the availability of aircraft. Uh, they're not telling them, they're not saying that publicly, but behind the scenes, I know it's happened in the past. I'm sure it might be happening again now. Mark, let me uh, try to put a silver lining on this. <laughs> uh, it's so true. I think, you know, we've seen the perfect storm. We've seen the, you know, the world go through this pandemic and, and industries, not just ours, but so many industries um, being reduced and, and constrict. And in the MRO, uh, of course, we saw it as well. Uh, where, where shops, where OEMs, where so many suppliers reduce their capacity, not knowing what the future would bring, um, there was significant capacity in the market. Uh, we've also seen a turn. In the perfect storm now, at that same time, we've lost a lot of talent in the industry, a lot of early retirements, uh, a lot of people in skilled labor um, walk away from their jobs. And there's a significant demand now for talent, just as the MROs are picking back up. So the silver lining, uh, if I will, um, is the jobs now are widespread. And while we've seen this cycle uh, through the pandemic and, and now being, I'll say, uh, um, you know, impacted by the, the war and, and other factors, uh, the jobs now are are tremendous. Uh, and there really is a lot of uh, potential for, of course, Embry-Riddle students and, and real talent in the industry. So it's been a cycle and, and we see that um, the, the industry itself is coming back. 
and I know you see that the, uh, the, the number of jobs and the diversity of those jobs are, is really strong. Okay. And so that was a perfect follow on to the next question. Uh, one of the things that a lot of you have heard is there's a pilot shortage and uh, there's also a mechanic shortage. And so since this is an MRO discussion, I'd like to ask our panelists, what, what, what are some things from at least your sector of the industry are you seeing being done to address the mechanic shortage? Obviously, there's a lot of folks here and a lot of other people in school that, that will be entering the work market, but, but what right now are you seeing or, or what trends are, or measures are you taking to take care of that, that shortage? I hate it when they answer all at once. Yeah, yes. yeah there is <laughs> there is a lot of creativity and, and things that companies are doing uh, to to reduce the attrition rates uh, in, in the companies, um, to retain the employees, and uh, really to build um, uh, pipelines of people and talent in the, in the uh, companies themselves. So a and mechanics and skilled labor, um, you're right, there's not only people leaving the industry, but then moving around. So there's a lot of churn in the industry of uh, mechanics moving from different places. We've seen that as well. And um, we're partnering with uh, third party uh, recruiters. Um, we're adding benefits. We're doing things that otherwise, you know, we're competing for the same workforce. So, uh, you know, clearly the 145 in the schools um, uh, has a big and tall order uh, to deliver deliver mechanics specifically. Yeah, I want to follow on from that. So at Delta Airlines, we initiated a um, early, early, early retirement program um, uh, at the start of COVID that was combined with what we called an early out package. So every single employee at Delta Airlines, whether you had been there two days or 35 years, were given a package. Overnight, we lost 26% of our workforce at Delta Tech Ops that took the package. We lost 70,000 years of experience overnight. Let's sink in a little bit. And so we had to adjust. And we have. But we had, we've had to build up again. And we're in the process of doing that. So everything that's been said here about the, the mechanic shortage is absolutely true. So what's happening is, is it's a very competitive environment for those of you that want to become an aircraft maintenance technician and you're qualified and certified. You can almost name your price and I'm not kidding. And that's an amazing time to be an, an aircraft maintenance technician. We're having to compete for people just like everybody else where for years the line to get into Delta was around the corner. It was hard to get into Delta. And we, we always want to be competitive, but we always want to be selective as well. What we're finding is we're really having to work really hard proactively to make that happen. We're also starring, you know, if you know, if you're going to, you know, if the old ad adage of if you're in the forestry business, you have to do what every day? Plant trees. Aircraft mechanics, not too different, but you can't start when they're in high school. It's too late. They've already decided what they want to do. You want to get somebody's mind occupied? What we found, what Delta found is you're talking early middle school, late grade school. We bring in busloads of kids to Delta Tech Ops in Atlanta. You want to see the face of a 10 year old boy or girl underneath a triple seven that's doing a gear swing? That's pretty cool. You want to see a, you know, a face just amazed? That's where it starts. You chose Embry Riddle for a reason. Somewhere that fire within you started somewhere. I guarantee you it wasn't when you were in your third year of high school. It started somewhere before that. And so what we're realizing is the effort planted, the effort put forth when they're much younger. It's very important. One, one last thing before I pass it to one of my colleagues is the, the, the conduit we had from the military has gone down significantly. So the number of mechanics coming out of the military isn't what it used to be. It just isn't. 
And what we're finding is um, the percentage of, of mechanics AMTs coming out of the military who want to remain AMTs isn't what it was. They want to do something different. So the interest of, of turning a wrench or do, working on aircraft, it's going to take a lot more proactive effort from the industry than it has previously. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, talking, uh, talking from a different sector of the industry, uh, private and corporate aviation, uh, we've had to get pretty creative in how we go after, uh, after mechanics and techs. Uh, the segment is offering a lot of perks right now to guys just coming out of school, coming out of school. Um, with uh, signing bonuses uh, that are uh, engaged after 90 days of employment, uh, uh, tool chest and tools being offered, and other perks uh, in the way of training, other training to uh, come into our segment. Um, I personally uh, work on a bi weekly uh, basis with a uh, technical school, one of the oldest in the country. I'm lucky enough to have one of their locations right next to my hangar at Youngstown. Uh, they pump out about a, they're pumping out about 90. I think their graduating class in April here is going to be 92 people. Most of them will not even go into the aviation industry because they're being lured away by other industries like Otis Elevator and uh, other companies that are willing to pay them more than this industry is. So we've got to really wake up as to what the value of people who want to enter this industry really is. Um, and that's happening. Um, people are getting more aggressive. I know I've got, my company's got more aggressive with, uh, Entry level uh, mechanics, but the fact is, is we're losing so much gray hair on the other side of the spectrum. We have to also uh, be mining for experienced mechanics and basically headhunting uh, our competitors and neighbors to try to bring people on board. Um, it's a it's a really dynamic. Uh, situation to be in and be going through, especially when you work on specific products that require specific training. And these people may not have any of that type of background uh, coming into your organization. So not only the cost of bringing them on and enticing them, there's the cost of orienting them towards the type of business you're doing. So you have to be cognizant of that when you go when you approach an employer and want to work for them, that the their investment doesn't stop with them hiring you. It's just starting. And uh, our dilemma is, is we put a lot of time and effort into you that you don't really see. And then you decide two years later, you're going to leave to go to another job. And they're holding the bag on the training that you're walking out the door with, that you benefit from sometimes, and sometimes not, maybe. I don't think any experience you, you don't benefit from, unless it's bad experience. But um, so, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's a segment right now. I can remember it happening back in the 80s. Same type of thing happened. It was a big purge of uh, World War II mechanics. Now we're looking at Vietnam and beyond mechanics and it's another cycle and you gotta be creative and aggressive to be able to bring in good talent and you also have to be ready to train them and to manage them. In, anybody else on this one? one? One thing I'd like to add that, that believe it or not, the FAA is helping with the training of mechanics. They recently, uh, dropped a new version of part 147, which in the past required 1900 hours of, of training face-to-face. -face. Now it's based on experiential training. 
which could really shorten the amount of time that mechanics spend in schools. I know there's several mechanics in here in the, in the maintenance program. So uh, it, it's not gonna help you, but, but I think for future when the programs get rewritten, it, it could also be a big addition. So, all right, so let, let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk about uh, one of the more pressing items and that's the supply chain. Um, last year, the container ship Evergreen was sideways in the Suez Canal for six days, as we've all heard about. What impact to the panelists here um, if any, does that incident or other supply chain issues continue to have on the MRO supply chain? Um, and what steps do you see being taken to mitigate those, uh, those issues? I'll take a stab at this. Um, not so much the, the evergreen going sideways, but what I'll say is it's more tied to the geopolitical aspect. Let me explain. Um, in, uh, in the jet engine world, in the jet engine MRO world, you have, I, 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 I already mentioned OSRs, outside service repairs, to vendors. Well, those vendors, they're not necessarily in Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, and Mississippi. They could be in Singapore, they could be in Taiwan, they could be in China, um, they could be in India. And regular vendors of ours, I mean, Singapore is a, is a, is a huge center for component repair for engines globally. And so when there is an issue, you heard about all the ships that are that can't get into can't get into port for a various number of reasons, where whether it's Long Beach or San Francisco or Miami or Baltimore, you know, those are, you know, trade goes many ways. And so some of the material that is trying to get to these places so they can do their job and get those parts back to us it's a problem and that means now you're bound for air freight so air freight has been significantly hampered it's very expensive and so now back to the cost issue so i'll just say that from a supply chain standpoint if you're transporting anything internationally over the past 18 months it has not been a fun exercise because you have no idea what your costs are going to be so to Jim's point, you know, and being a 30 year sales guy, you know, you know, challenges breed opportunity. So does it mean people look at things differently? You bet they do. Do I have to go to Singapore for that vendor on the HPT blades? Maybe not. Maybe we need to look elsewhere. So it's going, it's forcing people in the industry to look at things differently just because, well, that's the way we've done it forever. Because of the challenges that we're seeing, supply chain, geopolitical situations, and other logistical matters, and costs of shipping, it's forcing companies to look at different ways to do things other than they've ever done it. So, let's. Yeah, to support that, um, we have seen a lot of operators kind of using their engines very selectively to try to extend life on wing. Um, a lot of focus on takeoff D rates and things like that too. And um, bring, keeping more aircraft in service, but with reduced utilization to keep engines moving, but to not um, use up too much of their capacity um, to keep having to, from having to send engines into overhaul. Um, with the shipping issues, we heard of a lot of airlines who were preferring to hold on to engines to maybe send them into shop at a later date because not necessarily that turnaround times in the shop were very long, but that shipping time just took absolutely forever. And it was a real problem for getting engines back on wing to have aircraft in the air. So a lot of really interesting utilization from the airline's perspective um, to keep engines from having to go into, into overhaul really quickly. Um, that's been a big one. One of the first things we saw in the supply chain started delays were tire, aircraft tire. And it wasn't so much the rubber part of the tire, it was the labor to build the tire. That's what really surprised me. And uh, one of the OEMs I work with told me that they have airplanes sitting outside with parts not on the aircraft. They can't deliver the aircraft. 
So they're actually going in the factory, and pulling parts off of the aircraft as they're coming down the line and putting them on the airplanes outside so they can deliver the airplane. A lot like the F-150 sitting up in Lorraine of all the Fords that they built and they have all the chips that they can't get and they're sitting out there and they can't deliver the truck. So they're robbing Peter to pay Paul and they're seeing more and more parts that they can't get so they can't deliver some of these airplanes. They can't complete some of these airplanes uh, on the line. They can't complete some of the airplanes so they're parking them outside. And then when the parts come in, they finally have to complete them, certify them, and then they can deliver them. So it's becoming more and more evident that the supply chain is starting to slow down. And eventually, like Steve said, the material side of it will be affected with some of the products like the titanium, the aluminums, uh, some of the mineral side of it that we use to manufacture the fuselages and some of the gear parts and things like that. Anything else on this one? I was just going to say for a bit of mitigation, we have seen a lot of suppliers um, purchasing their their own supply chains to try and keep um, those uh, those supply chains alive, um, which has been really helpful. I think the big example with that is uh, Safran on the engine side um, purchasing, I think it was two layers down of their supply chain, um, which really helped keep things moving for them. Well, I, I have a follow-up to this question, and, and it, it kind of is along the same supply chain issue, but one of the, uh, the um, outcomes or, or the, the uh, reactions to COVID was that a lot of business travelers would shy away from the airlines, and they actually would purchase their own airplanes, whether they were small little bug smashers or the larger or the lower end uh, corporate aircraft, and that also put a strain on, on the supply chain, or, or not only the supply chain, but also the MRO as far as being able to or needing to repair these aircraft as well. Would anyone like to address that, that issue? Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, when I retired from Textron in 2019, uh, the industry was in a slowdown and they were technically asking people to leave. Uh, they started laying people off, slowing the factories down, slowing the production rates down. And then we went through COVID. And then as we were starting to come out of COVID the end of 2020, all of a sudden, the rich people decided, you know, we don't have to fly the airlines anymore. We can start uh, chartering airplanes. We can start buying uh, membership cards. We can start buying into NetJets fractional, or we can start buying our own airplanes. So all of a sudden, these companies that own these airplanes or manage these airplanes started getting really high demands, and the, and the availability of planes started becoming scarce. And what that did was put a strain on the used aircraft market and some of the old aircraft that were gonna be shelved or parted out or put out to pasture, you might say, uh, companies started saying, well, heck, we can put these into MROs and have overhauled engines put on, have them refurbished, have new panels put on, have them repainted, put them back into service. An old beach jet that was, uh, say 20 years old, we can put another 10 years life in it and get 10 more years out of it. So we go to these conventions and all the used aircraft salesmen, they had nothing to sell. And I think we had an example this morning, didn't we, Doug, that uh, you had a, a Gulfstream that went from what, 5.2 million up to 7.1 million? Just, yeah, an, an old, a 20 year old Gulfstream went up just like that. And so the values of these uh, used aircraft have gone up so much because of supply and demand. So right now, a lot of these companies don't have enough lift and they're struggling and the customers are, are struggling because they want to take their families places and they don't want to fly the airline because they want to be picked up at an FBO and take their dog with them and their wife and their beach towels and go on their private vacations and, uh, do, and do their thing because they can afford it. So it's really created quite a different demand. And what's happened is the MROs are staffed accordingly to do the normal work 
and they've put a strain on the MROs with all these used aircraft. And then you have the demand with less mechanics or less technicians. So it's created a time where there's overtime and then you have the supply chain with the parts. And so it's, it's really created chaos in the MRO world. Anybody else on this one? Rick? Um, it really has ignited the activity in the uh, private travel segment of the industry. Um, you've had a segment of people or of our population that's been able to afford private travel for quite a long time, have never chosen to because of the efficiency and the availability of commercial travel, especially with uh, first, uh, first class service. When the pandemic came along and the restrictions came along, um, that really put a, uh, a, a put a dire demand on that segment to say, I want to travel and I don't want to go by airline. Now, I don't think it's a, it's a trend that's going to just stop. Uh, there's still uh, pressure on demand. I think it's going to be there. It may become permanent. And uh, it may actually bring down the demand for commercial travel over uh, private travel. Uh, all depends on whether uh, the private segment can keep up with uh, the pressure it's being put on. And it, it is pretty severe, uh, like Roger said. So I, I really think we've seen a paradigm shift in how people look at air travel, in the United States at least. And um, I don't expect it to go away anytime soon. And the reason I say that is there's not just pressure on fractional ownership and charter, but there's been a lot of aircraft per first time purchasing going on. And I think that's where the, uh, the element of a shift really lies. Private aircraft travel is up 38% over where it was last year. Year over year, yeah. yeah. It's, it's just amazing and it, uh, it's rising. So we expect that trend to continue. Yep. Okay, our next question, and we're gonna kind of shift gears a little bit and, and talk a little bit about technology. You know, as we know, MRO is a very technology driven industry. Um, and I'd like to ask the panelists, what game changing advancements in technology are currently being implemented and what others are expected in the near future. And examples of this would be things like additive manufacturing, drones, robotics, blockchain analytics, uh, et cetera, AI. <clears throat> and anything that you're seeing or anything that comes to mind uh, that, that you're dealing with? How about uh, RFID? We, um, RFID has been out for quite a while. And I think uh, outside of our industry, a lot of, um, uh, warehousing and, and big box stores have been using RFID for a long time. And it really has been uh, prototyped in MROs uh, for many years. But now with the shortage of personnel and the reduction in cost for RFID, uh, we're really seeing it emerge. Um, we're starting to use it in, in the uh, warehousing for materials. Uh, we're using it in the tool rooms. Uh, to track calibrated tools, um, to have accountability for tooling. Um, and ultimately, it's becoming more mainstream in our industry. Yeah, you know, um, add some information here um, on two fronts. When, when COVID hit uh, at Delta, we parked between five and 600 aircraft. If you think about that. Five to six hundred aircraft over a number of different locations, different states, separated. Um, it put a huge, huge strain on our organization. A, just to get the aircraft there. B, to put them in the right preservation before you shut everything down. And and then because it it was about six months later, and then you started waking the aircraft back up again. Um, 
we were in the midst of looking at drone technology at the time, and it sort of, I'm going to yet again use Jim Buckaloo's silver lining here. It forced Delta to take something that was in its concept phase and push it forward. And we used drone technology to inspect aircraft in the desert when we began to wake the aircraft up. And um, it was approved FAA. Um, we were, it was new to Delta, but we said, okay, let's, let, let, let's give it a go. We had drones flying around our aircraft that had been sitting for months. And the number of man hours that were saved by drone technology in waking up wide body aircraft to inspect them visually, you cannot fathom. And it was amazing. And it was really something that was, um, it was, you know, it came faster than we would have liked for it and, you know, come on like a freight train. Um, but boy, it, we really learned a lot in the process and it, and it saved us a lot. Remember, this is at, at, at the same time, I talked about that loss of brain trust at Delta when people took the early retirement packages. Oh, guess what? Oh yeah, that was right in the middle of the same time. So the drone technology ended up being a blessing in disguise for us, and we, 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 we propelled it forward. The other thing I want you that, that, that is really a, a Pandora's box issue is, and it's interesting, there are six, over 650 leased aircraft that are being operated by Russian carriers. Now, we can have a long discussion about the records keeping, and Sloan knows all about this, and Jim is very well, as are some of my other panel members, but when your aircraft is leased, you have to keep the records. And for years and years and years, a lot of this record keeping was, was actual. Talk about boxes upon boxes of, of pieces of paper, what we call DFPs, dirty fingerprint um, papers that follow the engine and the aircraft around. And so does this situation in Russia, which is horrific for the leasing industry, let alone the geopolitical components of what's going on. From, from a commercial aviation perspective, it's a nightmare. The likelihood of these aircraft ever coming out of Russia is very slim. But is this a time to take a look at, is there any way for us to go really, truly digital for an aircraft records and engine records perspective? It's kind of a leap right now, but if this is a catalyst, for us to make that change, maybe now's the time to do that, as hard as it is. But the reality is there is some truth in that. So I'll just pass it. Anything else on this one? Okay, good. Well, one thing I'd, I'd like to add on the RFID point is, is that the industry, and recently because of the pandemic and the increased use of RFID, is becoming more three-dimensional. Usually it used to be that you would be able to track an object when it went by a reader. Now you can look at a computer screen and watch the object move around a building. So that's becoming, and, and people, you can RFID people as well. And so it's, it's really, really changing quite a bit. The um, next question, and kind of, you know, we've talked a lot about costs and things, or a little bit about costs, but the industry has seen a rapid rise in cost um, in things such as oil, spare parts, consumables, raw materials, labor, et cetera. Um, how has the MRO industry, your segments of the MRO industry, responded to these increases? And what changes do you feel may become permanent? What do you see some things that we're not going to turn back on that we've started implementing because of COVID or supply chain or other recent events? I know we've had to take an aggressive approach to uh, costing and uh, reviewing what we're charging for our services. Um, I would say in the last six months, we've probably raised our pricing twice. And that's in response to our labor costs and our uh, overhead. And I don't see it slowing down in the immediate future, um, especially if we have to compete and uh, for labor. So, um, uh, it's it's definitely there and it's definitely happening. I don't see it just stopping anytime soon. 
Yeah, I don't see a silver lining here at all. <laughs> oh, that's not good. Uh, every dimension of the industry is getting more expensive. We talked about transportation. Uh, the transportation cost of everything we do is higher. Uh, the material, raw materials cost is higher. Uh, the cost of labor uh, we talked about in depth is higher. Um, typically, uh, like Rick mentioned, we pass that on to the customer. So that cost of doing business is is much higher. It's going to drive innovation, um, but but clearly our space, uh, our industry, has a higher cost. Uh, let alone most recently the cost of um, crude oil, and ultimately. Uh, that impact uh, is directly on our industry. So we're going to look hard for that silver lining for sure. Mike, I think there's something that we will never see change is the working with the government. It seems like the FAA and the government is always hard to work with. They're always slow to react. They're always hard to put things through and they are are so hard to get to respond to a change. And when you, when you put something in that's very innovative, I remember when we were building our fiber placement machines and working on our composite fuselage uh, jets at Raytheon Aircraft, how they bucked us. I mean, they, they just, they couldn't believe it. They, even though there were other companies that, that said, we have this technology, we're building the cells. They're using the same Cincinnati Millicron machines. And here we are building fuselages and, and Rick saw the fuselages we built. And to bring those same FAA guys over to Wichita to see us build those, they, they just didn't want to approve them. And it took so much extra time to convince them that these things were gonna fly. And then once they flew, it was like, wow, why, why couldn't we get these things done quicker? So it just seems like the FAA, the government regulations, they just take so long to change and, and to approve them. That's a good point. Um, and by the way, the FAA is having a labor problem too, big time. I mean, we used to give visits all the time from the FAA because we, A, were really close to them and a uh, pretty good sized shop. So they decided that we were a good training ground for their people, uh, but we don't see them anymore. And uh, we, we have to interface with them in ways we never had to before, uh, just to try to get response out of them so we can stay legal and be in compliance. Uh, it's all the innovation we talk about, Dr. Um, is being drugged back by the fact that the regulations aren't moving uh, near as fast as the technology is. And that's a big problem. I did want to make a comment about, um, again, we've been talking about the challenges relative to supply chain and material. All that's true. Costs going up, all that's true. Um, and again, Jim's going to be the, the, the silver lining guy forever. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to stick with him. So, so I will say this, that because of the challenges the engine OEMs are having, we have, and I say this, this may be not real wood, maybe it's processed wood, I don't know, I'm going to knock on it anyway, is we have seen an uptick in the past six months in the OEMs starting to approve repairs where they otherwise wouldn't have done so. Because what's happening is the engine shops are so clogged before the OEM model was, well, I'm not going to authorize you to do a repair because I want you to do what? Buy new. So they limited the repairs that they would authorize people like Delta Tech Ops to generate. That's changing. In the last 60 days alone, they've approved over 15 to 20 repairs on the Pratt & Whitney 2000 engine that powers a 757 that's been in our fleet for, oh, I don't know, 30 years, they've never approved that in this particular area. What we're seeing is Rolls-Royce is doing that, GE is doing that, Pratt & Whitney is doing that. So we are actually adding 
repair development engineers to our staff because we need repair development engineers more than we ever have for that very reason. So one challenge presents an opportunity and that's a good example. And we are seeing progress. Function of the FAA to have to approve a repair because as in the manufacturer, you can do that, right? Correct. Okay. That's correct. From a little bit of a different perspective, um, a lot of commercial engines in particular are um, on program, um, which can look like a lot of different things, but um, basically with, with rising costs, it can be quite difficult on something like an FMP or an on-program agreement to pass those costs on to customers when you're paying a fixed price per flight hour, essentially, um, and prices are going up, those agreements are fixed. It can be quite difficult to do that. So it is going to force some creativity um, internally on the MRO side in their financial restructuring um, when they are not able to pass those costs on as well. Just, just so we're clear, the term FMP, Fleet Management Program, what that means is Airline X pays a fixed flight hour rate for its fleet given a certain number of parameters. What Sloan was alluding to is if I signed that contract four years ago and it's got an escalation clause of X, but these all these geopolitical issues notwithstanding, the OEM doesn't have the ability to change that price. They're stuck with it. And so if they don't do something, they're going to lose their shorts. And I mean in the tens upon tens of millions of dollars. So there is a lot writing on this. So people who um, OEMs that sign these dollar per engine flight hour, dollar per cycle hour programs that are multi-year, the longer the term, the greater the risk. It's, it's great for the operator because your costs are fixed and the OEMs to a certain extent have known what the escalation is gonna be based upon a number of factors. We're in no man's land. This has never happened before. So they're scared to death because this could really put somebody like Rolls-Royce in a tougher spot than they already are. Because Rolls-Royce has a much higher percent of, of the Rolls-Royce engines flying in the world today has a very high percentage of these types of programs. Whereas the other engine manufacturers, it's lower. So Rolls is exceptionally exposed, exceptionally exposed. Because I think their penetration of this type of program in their entire worldwide fleet is over 90% let that sink in for a little bit. So you think Rolls Royce is having some sleep, sleep, sleepless nights? You bet they are. It'll be really interesting to see how the government supports the FAA going forward with all this uh, e-business that's coming up with the new battery technology and the new urban air support that's coming up because the FAA has got a mountain to climb on that because there's so much of that being put forth in development today that uh, they got their hands full. And not only with airline and business aviation and all the engine manufacturing that's going on and all the changes that are going on there, but all the new development that, that's going on with uh, all this new uh, upcoming future development. And it'll really be interesting to see how the FAA reacts to the to the changes coming up. That key word may be a problem, react. We only have a couple of questions left. Uh, what I'd like to do, and, and, and by the way, it's a great industry. Aviation is a great industry to work in. Uh, and the thing to remember is <laughs> where you have challenges, you have a lot of opportunities. And, and you're hearing some of that here, but I, I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, Next question, you know, with all the industry of people that we've been talking about, um, given both economic and operational aspects of today's aviation industry, how do the panel members feel about the current capacity situation within in the MRO industry, given things like people buying their own airplanes and, and that sort of thing? And do you see a backlog? Or, from your perspectives, are you seeing backlogs or excess capacity? And how are the MROs and airlines handling those, uh, those, those situations? That's all upside, Mike. Yeah, I hope so. Good, good. Pure opportunity. Um, it is a, a significant constraint, right? The capacity of the industry is limited right now. 
uh, by all the factors we just talked. Um, but there's going to be investment, right? There's big investment in new facilities, big investment in the technology and, and innovations to overcome these things. Um, but, you know, that will spark, you know, uh, whether it's whether it's building the facilities or uh, outsourcing the regulatory requirements, uh, just really a paradigm shift on everything we know it. But um, it really is going to take the innovators um, and the regulators uh, to, to balance the needs of the industry. I think uh, holistically, our comments are meant to tell you that there's great change in the industry, but we don't mean to tell you that there isn't great opportunity in the industry. So please don't take our negativity <laughs> wrong. Uh, it's not negative. It's okay. Uh, it's the fact that it's dynamic, it's cyclical, and you're 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 going to. You're going to be walking into an industry that's going to be uh, very challenging, and um, a lot of us would have never dreamt we were walking through some of the um, some of the environment we are now in a business aspect ever. I would have never imagined it, and um, but I certainly don't want to uh, eat our young by saying that it's negative because it's not. And um, and you're our young, so um, you know it, it's it, it's really a uh, dynamic and great industry, and I just don't want to lose sight of that. Okay. Uh, nobody's going to eat anybody's young here. It's okay. It's all right. So we'll make sure it's. <laughs> so so back so to the quest, it's question. It's not going to talk about capacity. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I would say um, uh, in in. Let's just take jet engines. I, I, I always get a little knot in my stomach when people get macro about the jet engine world. It is a very dynamic world, the engine MRO space. So relative to capacity, it depends upon the engine type. The engine type situation in today's MRO world varies significantly. If you take the V2500, the CFM 56, the LEAP 1A, the LEAP 1B, the GTF, the CF6, CF6, ADC2, ADE, the, the list goes on. The specific dynamic for each of those engine types is different. It's not the same. As I sit here right now, there are no slots available for Pratt & Whitney 2000 engines to induct on planet Earth. Let that sink in for a second. None, zero, because we're waiting for sp spare parts from Pratt & Whitney. If you have a CFM 56, 5B or 7B, there are 50 MROs on the planet and they're hungry. They'd love to take that engine, okay? Talk about the Pratt & Whitney 4000, Pratt & Whitney 4000, 112 inch engine powers the 777. Can't find a slot because why? There's only two places on planet Earth that do that engine and they have no slots. I could go on, but do you get my point? It varies significantly when it comes to capacity. In some areas, there's plenty of capacity. In some areas, it's very limited. And some of it's constrained by the number of MROs that are available and that varies the older an engine gets in its life cycle, the smaller the amount of MROs there are to do that work. Pratt & Whitney 2000. There are two places you can overhaul that engine. Two. Hanover, Germany, and Atlanta, Georgia. That's it. I could go on like CF6. It, there's probably six places in the world. So remember that. Somebody talks about it from a macro perspective. You have to get to the micro level to really dig in and understand it because it's very dynamic. I will say this, airframe MROs are full, generally speaking, especially for wide bodies. If you have a wide body, if you're a leasing company and you want to transition, one, 
an A330 or a triple seven or an MD11 from one operator to another. And Jim's, Jim can speak at this way better than I can, but I'll tell you, trying to find a wide body MRO slot where you don't have a guaranteed slot in the next year, good luck. It's just not available because wide body MROs don't grow on trees. And a lot of them are in China. And the pandemic has really challenged that. So it's a, it's a simple question with a very complex response. I just wanted you to understand the dynamics that are involved in such a complex response. Steve, let's talk about some of the innovation that's uh, been created. <laughs> Um, you know, before COVID, before the, the war, before, you know, a number of the turndowns, we've had, you know, emerging technologies. And I think you're right about the regulators uh, easing or accepting some of the changes. Uh, biofuels, uh, there's a number of airlines that have uh, operated their commercial aircraft with biofuels uh, long before, you know, the, the price of crude oil has gone up. I think there's going to be a turn toward biofuels. Um, electric aircraft, right? Electric powered aircraft. Uh, it's going to be a solution in our lifetime where we see electric powered aircraft. We see them already with the, the drones, you know, the, the ultralights and, uh, and the uh, UAVs and the aircraft that you can buy today. Um, you know, some of the other innovations are going to turn this industry around. And it's certainly accelerating them today. So while we are talking about the current state, um, we have to think about the, the midterm and the long-term solutions as well. We saw a number of them um, slow pedal before COVID. We saw uh, you know, a lot of innovation, uh, but we didn't need to go there, you know, hydrogen power. Uh, there's a lot of solutions out there that we're going to see, you know, great universities like this find solutions. Any other comments on that one? Okay. Well, I, I wanted to follow up that question a little bit and talk a little bit about the, uh, or have you talk a little bit about the OEMs and their impact on the, uh, the, the market right now? Uh, they're, they're emerging into, in, into this area, into the MRO area, as I think Steve knows very well and has mentioned. Yeah, I, at the end of the day, you have to go back to um, what was the what was the model for selling jet engines? For a number of years, it was there was competition. The if you were ordering new engines, what ended up happening is you got a very large discount off of your original engine purchase. And so over the years, the OEMs have gotten smarter and said, "Well, I know a way to make it up." not just spare parts, I'm going to do the maintenance. So I'm going to sell the engines with the maintenance package. So Rolls-Royce captured that model a long time ago. And it was very lucrative for them, very lucrative. You know, there's other dynamics, and I, I alluded to it earlier. But when I was at Pratt & Whitney and I was at IAE, where I sold the V2500, um, the FMP that I mentioned, that Sloan mentioned, we wanted to sell as many of those as possible. Because why? Because of cash flow. You know, I'm not sure if you know how selling jet engines work is, but the bottom line is you, you, you negotiate a discount. And what ends up happening is, is you actually pay the aircraft manufacturer to put the credit on the, on, 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 on the aircraft when it gets delivered. It's insane. I mean, my dad wasn't in aviation. He says, who thought that up? He goes, it's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And then you make it up. So when you sell a large engine program, new, you don't make a red cent until probably 20 years in the program. But if you have an aftermarket program, there's a chance you can pull that forward, right? It's not 20 years, it's eight or seven. And so as it relates to that is the OEMs now very much ingrained. And so Pratt & Whitney took a page out of the Rolls-Royce playbook and said, okay, when you, sell a, when you, when you buy a geared, tur a geared turbofan, you have to come to me. I'm not even giving you the option. So that's even more than what Rolls Royce said. It's like, you have to come to me. So that's what Pratt decided. So if you have a geared, tur a geared turbo fan at Pratt, you have to go to Pratt. And so that's a huge departure from where Pratt was. So that gives you an indication of just one OEM, how they migrated from like the middle phase, boom, 
all the way to the right because it means that much to them. It's cash flow. They want that cash flow up front as soon as possible, which makes sense. But the hard part is if you didn't buy that aircraft or engine new, you weren't the beneficiary of the big discount. And that's another story for another day. And in the business aircraft world, the Dassault's, the Gulfstreams, the Beechcrafts, the Cessnas did the same thing. They controlled their warranty costs by setting up their own service centers and factory owned service centers. And then they had some independent service centers because they couldn't handle all the work. So once the aircraft went out of warranty, they hoped to get the aftermarket. Uh, that was all gravy to them because they could sell the parts and make all the profit on the parts and the labor. Well, they've sold so many airplanes that they can't handle the volume. And especially today, just ask Rick, uh, ask today, uh, they have so many airplanes out there that they can't handle it, but they've had to grow their service center network or build new service centers or buy some of these independents to make larger capacity. And uh, it's sort of, caught them in the wrong place, and it's become sort of a dynasty in some of the, uh, the companies, and they haven't been able to handle it. It's become too big. So they've uh, had to build new buildings, and some of them have even had to sell some of them off to other companies like the Duncan Aviations, who have been masterful at the independent uh, companies that can work on multitude of business jet air aircraft and uh, have, have made uh, just a fortune on uh, the aftermarket support on these aircraft. But today, the business is stretched so thin that uh, the capacity is not there because there's so many of these used aircraft going in these shops that uh, there's just not the amount of space or mechanics to work on these planes. So the OEMs have almost done it themselves. And all that this kind of serves to do really for the operators is truly limit uh, competition in the market, um, keeps prices relatively, potentially relatively high, um, and forces operators, you know, into one particular direction for um, any of their MRO needs. Um, and something that MROs have also learned, particularly roles having been in that space for so long, on some of their older engine programs are realizing that it's actually not helpful for them um, to kind of keep a grasp on the MRO market for something, say the RB211 uh, program that is still incredibly active right now. Um, Rolls has given up a lot of its uh, specific capacity in that in that space to allow other competitors to come in and reduce prices which has then kept those engines flying longer because it's become cheaper to maintain them um, on the 7.5 program which is um, huge for cargo right now um, so yeah definitely there's a, a place for all of it but sometimes it's not always the best the best thing to do i alluded earlier to uh what does a leasing company do when they're re remarking an aircraft from operator A to operator B? Case in point, let's talk about what happened in, happens in the real world. So Singapore Airlines had a very large fleet of 777-200ERs that were Rolls-Royce Trent 800 powered. And as they exited the Singapore fleet and got remarketed, they wanted to um, sell the aircraft. Well, they were not very sellable because potential operators were scared to death of Rolls-Royce because Rolls didn't have really have a program that was designed for the secondary third tier operator. They've gotten better at it. They have gotten better at it, but it's a, when you're, when you're looking at an engine like a Trent 800 that powers a triple seven and you have a fought event and you're looking at replacing that engine, it's very scary numbers if you're a smaller second or third tier operator. Rolls didn't have a mechanism to provide that support to Sloan's point, but they got smarter on the RV211 535E4 that powers a 757 because FedEx has 65 of them, 65 aircraft. UPS 
has, I think it's 25 or 30. And so it's very important to them. And there's other cargo carriers that operate the rolls powered 757. And so they sold that tooling and a company by the name of Standard Aero went in and put a facility in San Antonio to do those engines. So, um, and that Rolls-Royce has no part of that other than just supplying the tooling. Okay, I'll, we'll let that be the last word for, for the, the main part of the discussion. As Mr. Becker did mention at the beginning, this is a unique opportunity for you to hear from people that are out in the trenches. They're in the industry, they're doing it. So now we're going to spend a little time and give you a chance to ask questions. So if you raise your hand, I'll bring the mic around and, or is there a mic back there? Do you wanna leave it back there? Okay. So if you have questions for any of the panelists, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, step back and, and ask your question at the mic at the back. And, and anybody? Oh, yes, young lady, please. I'll, I'll start it off. And first of all, just thank you everybody for being here and be part of this. It's great. It's been very informative and it's a lot of it's just gone right over my head and I've learned a lot and that's been good to try to catch up. I'm going to draw the attention to something that seems a little obvious, but there's one person up there who looks very different than the others. Kind of straightforward, right? Uh, if you don't know Sloan, she's a member of our Young, Alum, Young Alumni Leadership Council. She's helped teach in the mini MBA. She is what I love to see our O'Malley College of Business students doing. But Sloan, I'd like you to speak to why you chose to go in the direction you did because not only is aviation very much a male dominated industry, but you are in a section when you're talking MRO and sales, that's very much more like them, less like you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I am a little different, I guess. Uh, this industry is incredibly male dominated. Um, for me in the appraisal space where I work right now, I kind of fell into it um, as I think most people do realistically. Um, I grew up in aviation, which I think definitely helped. Um, my father and both of my grandfathers um, worked at, at Pratt & Whitney. Um, so I kind of grew up around aviation and understood what was going on. But um, as I came through school and I came to Embry-Riddle for grad school, um, I really uh, just kind of took an interest personally in the um, physical, the asset side of things. I was studying finance. I really loved finance, which is also a, a male dominated industry. And the leasing world is also very male dominated, but a little bit more accessible. Whereas um, appraisals is very technical and very focused on the assets themselves with kind of finance as the context of what we're doing. Um, so through Ember Riddle, I started the ASA appraiser program um, back in 2017. Um, I got a scholarship to be able to do that, which taught basically how to appraise an aircraft. Um, and I just absolutely fell in love with it. I thought it was just the coolest thing um, I ever could have done. I uh, realized kind of the full context of what I had been learning through the finance space and then seeing it through what interested me most, the technical side of things and the aircraft themselves and the engines themselves, um, which is what I had been raised in and what I found the most interesting. It really all just kind of came together for me in that moment. And I realized that appraisals was really what, uh, the kind of side of the industry that I wanted to do and be a part of. Um, it can be very hard to break into that part of the industry. It's incredibly small. I think you can fit every appraiser in the world into this room. Um, and I believe that we have probably, but um, yeah, so it, it, it really is a very specific, very niche side of things, very hard to get into. But I think once you find something that truly interests you and really drives you, like for me, it was kind of the, the combination of the finance world and the aircraft themselves and the markets around particular assets, um, you really kind of find yourself in the right, in the right place. So that's kind of my story. Next question, anybody, especially those in you in my class, if you'd like to get up and ask a question. No, no pressure. No, we're good. Okay. 
Well, please join me in thanking this distinguished panel for being here today. Now, now, for those of you that were too shy to go back to the microphone and ask a question, our members will hang out for a few minutes. And if you want to come up and have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with them, please do so. Uh, for those of you that are getting credit, you think, for classes, there'll be some sign-up sheets outside for you to sign. Thank you very much for coming, everybody.